will not frustrate the righteous. He will not justify the wicked. The righteousness of a righteous man will answer for him in times to come. And the wickedness of a wicked man will pour upon his own head. Job chapter 4 verse number 7. My experience is, is starts from verse 7. In living, New Living Translation. He says, stop and think. Does the innocent person perish? When has the upright person been destroyed? My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will have as the same. Can I hear amen? amen? I repeat that. My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will have as the same. Amen. They perish by bread from God. They vanish in a blast of his anger. Though they are fierce young lions, they will all be broken and destroyed. The fierce lion will stab and the corpse of the lioness will be scattered. You will see that many of those who think they are in charge in this season, they are too to be broken. Because they refuse to humble themselves, they are about to be humiliated. It doesn't matter the pedestal, the position or the posture. God has not created a human being he cannot deal with. And so this morning in the name of Jesus in the midst of trouble, God is my peace. To start telling what happened at Lekki, what happened in this place, you are all witnesses. Is this the nation that our founding fathers envisioned? Is this what they delivered to us at independence? Is this the way they want this country to run? We have run this country aground. Right now, except God intervenes and begins to reign, we are doomed. The time has come when nothing is sacred anymore to young and old. I'd never, maybe I'm too young to know, but I'd never, in all the years I've lived, I've never seen men enter palaces of our kings and set them ablaze. I'd never seen. And if you say, oh, one is guilty by association. How about the Shawn of Ugumosho? You don't know. Those palaces were ransacked and, and, and they were destroyed. What as the Supreme or the court, the High Court and the Magistrate Court at the got to do with protests? Is it because some people have cases there, they had to burn their files? I had to be con condoling my friend and brother, Justice Candido Johnson. His chamber, his law court was born, and every book he had ever bought in his life, he was just saying, I thank God for life. And under all the 85 bosses that were born, who will suffer? The rich that have their cash? Something is wrong with us. Something is wrong with God. We have become insane people. Nigeria suddenly became the asylum of the world in the past one week. Let's ask God to intervene in our situation. He will judge the wicked. He will uproot the wicked. But let his righteousness exalt our nation. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bless your holy name this day and we thank you. We magnify you for what you are doing in our midst. We bless you because no one, no one, no one can do what you only can do. In Jesus' mighty name. That song simply says, and it's for you, it's for me. When trouble comes, is my peace. When we were young, and I'm still a young man, by all means. Oh, GD, I think we are still young. When we look at Papa, we know we are young. <laughs> we still have a long way to go. But listen, when we were young... When an Oba spoke, it was final. Talk less of a governor who can remove an Oba. We knew it was law. I asked some of the young people around me, I said, what is government? Do you know the answer they gave me? They said, government of the people for the people by the people. I said, you have all gone to college, that's, what you, that's democracy. And it was Abraham Lincoln who gave that definition. Government is a group of people to whom you have given authority to preside or to govern a community, a city, a state, a nation. And once you give them that authority until it's withdrawn, their word is law. When they tell you this is what we are doing, you better comply. But there are people, including clergymen, telling our children, saying, nothing can happen to you, just hold the flag. 
My Tinubu must have stolen your money. He has not stolen my money. Oh, it's government money that he used to build it. He used it to do something. And people are benefiting from it. There are many of you who read the national newspaper every day. But you have burnt it down now. I'm not, from, for, for all I care, don't think I'm speaking for Tinumbu or speaking for Oba or speaking, no. But the things you have ruined, can you rebuild them? Do you have what it takes to rebuild them? I understand it has run now into a trillion. The building blocks of nationhood are blueprints for the new Nigeria because the dark chapter of our history is not how Nigeria's story ends. All across the nation, there's a wave of people movement. It's a wave of citizen engagement championed by the so-called ordinary Nigerian who has proved, proven in extraordinary terms to be by no means ordinary. It began in Edo State with an awakening and resolute electorate that find the political establishment to make their voices heard and their votes count. And the vast couple of weeks, that wave has been transformed into a tsunami of people movement led by our young people who have had enough of the horrendous brutality of the now disbanded special anti robbery school service. I believe that this wave of people movement is a physical manifestation of the bad parents around the new Nigeria. As I observe the end SARS protest, I will not conclude that we are witnessing the crescendo of an era and the beginning of another. Ten years ago, when we convened civil society organizations under the umbrella of Save Nigeria Group, our objective was not to be the voice of the people, but to restore the voices of the voiceless in a nation where social mobilization had been frozen for too long at that time. Ten years later, the end Cyrus protest has assured me that a generation of Nigerians has a, has a reason and will clear and unmistakable voices refusing to dim their lights or to turn down the bottoms of their request because we have entered the era of Sorosuke. Can I hear you say that? Whispering the corridors of power, we are the era of war. Sarasuke, I salute the courage of this unbreakable generation. I salute the resilience of every Nigerian youth, name and name, who has stood up to be counted in this momentous era. A sudden remembrance. Remember at this time the heartbreaking tales of extortion, torture, rape a murder that drove our young people to the streets in the first place. We remember Linda Nkeji Igwetu, who in 2018 was reported to have been shot in a French car by SARS, SARS operatives the day before a personal parade at a southern nation as a member of the National Youth Service Corps, NYC Abuja. We remember Stella Ifeoma Abubu, Another cops member reported to have been raped and murdered while being unlawfully detained by SARS officials in Abuja. Remember Sally Ali Haruna, a 21 year old student of business administration at Ambrose Ali University in State, whose remains were found in a well after a reported raid in his hostel by SARS operatives. Remember Kazim Chiyami a promising Nigerian footballer who, based on eyewitness reports, was pushed out of a moving vehicle to his death by SARS operatives. We remember Femi Bello, an enterprising 300 level student of Kaduna State University, reported to have been arrested without charge and murdered extrajudicially in the cost of the Nigeria police force. We remember Tina Ezekwe. A 17-year-old secondary 
Secondary School girl who was killed by a police officer while assisting in her mother's shop. We cannot forget 20-year-old Jimo Isiak who was reportedly killed by operatives of the Nigerian police force as they violently climbed down on peaceful protesters in the Boma shop and whose unfortunate death prepared Nigerians across the nation in their rejection of police brutality. Our hearts bleed at the memory of the peaceful protesters at the lucky toll gate who was shot and killed on Tuesday, October 20, 2020, by the armed forces of the Nigerian state as they held up the Nigerian flag. Young compatriots pledging allegiance to one nation bound in freedom, peace, and unity as they sang their national anthem in their final moments. May I urge you to please rise and let us observe a moment of silence for these Nigerians and many others named and unnamed who have been unjustly killed by agents of the Nigerian state. One minute silence. May their souls rest in peace and may God Almighty comfort their families. Amen. You may be seated. The sound will remark the professionalism and bravery, sometimes doing so at the cost of their lives. In this regard, remember Sergeant Chukudi Bobo, who in 2017 was seen in a viral video bravely combating armed robbers at the bank in the Imo State, losing his life. Remember Inspector Musa Sunday, ironically of the now disbanded SARS, who in 2016 was reported to have been buried alive by hoodlums after he gallantly rescued a man who was been attacked by the same hoodlums while he was on duty in Oshoko, Ibeguleki, Lagos. Remember Sergeant Sunday, the double who was killed in the Laro Kubu State while firmly resisting an attempt by Hoodlums to snatch election results during the 2019 elections. Once again, may I ask you to rise and let us observe how many silence of these hundreds and hundreds of other unsung heroes of the Nigerian police force who lose their lives yearly in the line of duty. May their souls rest in peace and may God comfort their families. You may be seated. When the people elect their leaders, they hand over the responsibility to protect and defend them. The gun in the hand of the policeman is the closest, most visible, and most easily identifiable symbol of that handover of power and responsibility from the people to the government. The people do not have as much access to the president, governor, or even local government chairman or councillor as they do to the policeman on the street. Yes or no? Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. In other words, as far as the responsibility of the government, to guarantee the security and welfare of the people is concerned, the policeman on the street is the first ambassador of the government to the people. Any misuse of that power by the police, especially to repress and oppress any citizen, is ultimately an abuse of the power conferred by the people on their government. This is why the widespread protests against police brutality are justified. I have planned the efforts made by the government to address the protesters' demands. But the government must move from commitment to full compliance in the implementation of the 5 for 5 demands 
of the anxious protesters and the overhauling of Parisian architecture. Above all, I strongly recommend that President Muhammad Buhari should ensure that those who ordered armed soldiers to fire on innocent citizens are fished out and made to face the full weight of the law. The officers who carried out such wicked acts should also be prosecuted under international legal standards. Unfortunately, the protest took a sad turn. From the attacks on protesters by force to the infiltration of protests by woodlands, unleashing mayhem in cities and communities. According to Alan Bible, no nation no matter how enlightened, can endure criminal violence. If we cannot control it, we are admitting to the world and to ourselves that our laws are no more than a facade that crumbles when the wings of crisis arise. Furthermore, in the words of President Lincoln Bay Johnson, LBJ, the poor suffered twice at the righteous hands. First, when his destructive fury scars their neighborhood. Second, when the atmosphere of accommodation and consent is changed to one of hostility and resentment. Unfortunately, this is where the peaceful protests hijacked by Turks and Woodlands have landed us. But that as it may, governments at the federal and state levels have lent credence to the conclusion of protesters that the government itself was behind this most great tactics to discredit the protests. By its actions and inactions, the government has won the breach of trust. It is my hope that this address will help rebuild that breach and resolve the issues in the interest of the Nigerian nation. Our overarching challenge is systemic governance failure, which over the decades has worsened the living conditions of Nigerians. As a result, although the special anti-robbery squad has been disbanded like the spirit of Jezebel in the Old Testament that surfaced in the New Testament, although the special anti-robbery squad has been disbanded, the spirit of SARS continues to prowl unchecked. Therefore, let me your ears as I unveil to you the true meaning of SARS and why we must end SARS. For too long, the Nigerian people have been subjected to a less than desirable nation. For too long, the citizens of our country have been served insecurity, poverty, and underdevelopment. For too long, our people have been denied access to basic goods that make for a decent standard of living. We have been denied quality education, good health care, quality roads, access to electricity, and much more. The brutal impunity of the gun-wielding policeman or SARS operative is a symbol of this bad governance experience. SARS is also the symbol of that politician who loots public funds to build a political war chest and spend it during election buying votes, <laughs> hiring thugs, intimidating voters, and robbing the people of the power of choice. SARS is a symbol of the electoral officer who colludes with politicians to rob the people of their voice as expressed by the vote. SARS is a symbol of that appointed public official who, with a stroke of the pen, Rob the people of firms that are located to education, health care, and other social infrastructure. SARS is the emblem on the agbada of the legislature who robs the people through budget pardon, outrageous allowances, and an uncounted for constituency projects. SARS is the symbol of the corrupt judge who compels Lady Justice to remove our blindfold to check whether the person in the dark 
is a poor phone thief or a wealthy pension thief so as to sell justice to the highest bidder. Together with the murderous members of the police force who have robbed our young people of their lives with the trigger of a gun provided for them by the state, these pen robbers who deploy the powers, the privileges, and the provisions of their offices to rob the Nigerian people of our common patrimony are all operatives of SARS. They all belong to what I call the state aided robbery squad. That's the meaning of SARS. State aided robbery squad. Say that with me. State aided robbery squad. That is the true meaning of stars. State aided robbery squad. Fellow citizens, at the root of the issues that confront our nation is a foundational problem of nationhood that has persisted from one administration to another and provided a conducive environment for the state aided robbery squad. Until this foundational problem of nationhood is addressed, the call to end SARS will persist long after the disbandment of the special anti-robbery squad. No degree of brutal repression, I'd like to say that again, no degree of brutal repression of protesters can quench the flame of protest in the hearts and minds of the Nigerian people. To our government, I would like to say this. Your bullets may drive our citizens off the streets, but your bullets cannot pierce their spirits or puncture their resilience. <laughs> this speech is about how to disband the state-aided robbery squad and rebuild the foundations of our nation from the current undesirable state to the Nigeria of our dreams. At this juncture, I would like to pause and tender our sincere apologies to a generation deprived. Before I proceed to unveil the building blocks of nationhood, permit me to address an issue that is heavy upon my heart, for we cannot proceed with laying the building blocks of a new nation without addressing the issue of how older generations of Nigerians have failed our youth. By the older generations, I refer to the so-called independence generation, that is those who were born before and immediately after the independence of Nigeria. I refer to the parents and grandparents of the millennial generation. One can understand why the younger generation who so heavily indict preceding generations. At independence, we inherited a promising nation, but we are bequeathing a predatory nation to the young generation. We inherited a nation whose structural foundations were built on principles of true federalism, a nation in which diverse groups had the freedom to determine their destinies, but we are bequeathing a unitary nation Federal only in name, in which of national expressions are suppressed by an overbearing center. We inherited a nation in which free and functional basic education, as well as affordable and quality tertiary, tertiary education, guaranteed the path from penury to prominence. But we are bequeathing a nation whose educational system is lying in state. We inherited a nation where a young graduate was guaranteed immediate employment with housing and a car loan. But we have bequeathed a nation in which our youth are largely underemployed, unemployed, or Yahoo employed. We inherited a relatively secure nation characterized by thriving nightlife and peaceful village life, but we have bequeathed to the younger generation a society grappling with kidnapping, banditry, terrorism, and police brutality. We inherited a banner without stain. But very shamefully, 
We have introduced a new color to our green, white, green. Blood red. This is why there has been a definite generational spin to the protest. It is why we hear rallying Christ like, you mess with the wrong generation. It is why young people are telling stories of how they went out to protest in spite of the warnings of their parents. It is why you hear the inducting lamentation. If before I was born, the generation that were there had fought for a great Nigeria, I won't be here doing this. It is why some protesters have asked why the likes of Professor Shoyinka, Tunde Bakari, Obi Ezekwezeli, Patu Tomi, Femi Falano, the so-called senior activists in Nigeria, are not on the streets. To citizens of the young generation who are disappointed in the older generation, to those young freedom fighters who believe that the generation of their fathers and mothers has failed them, to those young Nigerians who have stood up to oppression, permit me to stand in the gap to apologize on behalf of my generation and the older generation to the undesirable state of the nation you are born into. I say on behalf of my generation and generation before me, we are sorry. We are very sorry for the undesirable nation you have inherited from us. We salute your courage. We applaud your, your resilience. We hear you. We share your pain. We share your story. We share your dreams for a better nation. And although you may not realize it, we did our best to fight for you. Fighting to ensure that you live in a nation where you can even air your views was what sentenced Professor Walesho Inka to a 22 months in prison as a 33 year old man. Fighting to ensure that you inherit a nation where every Nigerian has access to justice what was subjected my own boss, the late Chief Ghani Faimi, to three decades of harassment, assassination threats, and 32 episodes in detention. It's on record that Chief Ghani Faimi, in his lifetime, did not name any child by himself. Every child that was born to him by his first wife were named while he was in detention. Fighting for equity, justice, and dignity was what led to what led to Ken Sarawiwa's uttering his final words. Lord, take my soul, but the struggle continues. Fighting to ensure that every Nigerian is treated with respect was what deprived Dr. Joe Okeo Dumaki of the bliss of young womanhood and sent her to torturous detention cells no fewer than 17 times. Fighting to be cute to future generations, a nation governed by ideas rather than the barrel of a gun, was what subjected the likes of Professor Patu Tomi, Dr. Obi Ezekwezeli, and other members of concerned professionals to repression by a brutal military dictatorship. Fighting to ensure that the generation of their children would not be beaten, tear gassed, arrested, or shot at by the police or soldiers as they were was what sent the likes of Ulisa Bakuba, Femi Falano, Sheu Sonny, Inka Odumake, Chief Frank Kokori, the late Beck Oranson Kuti, the late Chima Obani, and many other pro-democracy activities, activists to the torturous jail cells of a cruel military junta. To ensure that you received a better nation was what sent Nadeko chiefs, those who were prominent Nigerians by right, inclusive of the lives of Professor uh, Bolajia Kiyemi seated here, uh, sent them to exile where they were living in conditions that your generation cannot even withstand. As I've had to explain to my children, fighting to be good to them and their generation, a better nation than the one I met, 
was what exposed me to the harassments, defamation of character, arrest, and threats to life that my children witnessed their dad being subjected to as they grew up in this country. It is obvious that the fight of my generation and the older generation before mine has not yielded the Nigeria that you, the youth of our nation, can be proud of. In 2002, at Grand Slam, an event that we hosted, gathering from across the nation's young Nigerians, from all across the six geopolitical zones in this country, I preached a message titled, Nigeria, a land filled with the crimes of blood. It breaks my heart to tell you today that 18 years later, this still holds true. The Nigerian landscape is filled to the brim with the blood of its citizens by its brutal repression of an armed protesters. The Nigerian state has blood on its hands. That agents of the Nigerian state will resort to using live ammunition to silence fellow citizens, fellow human beings, is heart-rending. Their blood will yet speak. I'm not sure you heard that. I said their blood will yet speak as truly as there is a God. In this time of great despair, we are united in pain with all who have suffered, in grief with all the families who are hurt with sorrow, and in a sense of shared loss with those whose hard and livelihoods have been damaged or burned. May God console all women in Nigeria and give us beautiful beauty for ashes. Amen. We, your generation and our generation, should be encouraged by the fact that every battle won is a step taken in the direction of a better nation. I cannot imagine how many times Papa Ayuadebanjo and Lechi uh, Papa Saolaniwaja he will call me several times. Odawo you, it's not in your hands. We have done our best. At 92 and over 90, they are still fighting. The battles won by the generation of your fathers and mothers has become the launch pad for you to fight and win this battle for the recognition and preservation of the dignity of human beings. But the fight is also a collaborative one. As some among the older generation observed the protests with a sense of history repeating itself, it was obvious after a while that it was time to deploy a diversity of strategies. The laudable creative expressions of the process were being threatened by descent into anarchy, even if state managed as alleged. The protests had also begun to infringe on the rights of law abiding Nigerians. It was clear that a change of strategy was required to avert the loss of lives, to safeguard the credibility of the movement, and to strengthen the gains made. To this end, we, and I better say I, so that I'm not, I'm not guilty of involving others in this matter, we reached out to the presidency and challenged the government to be empathetic to Nigerians and to address the demands of protesters. We also reached out to some prominent organizers of the protest to fashion a way out of the debacle. Unfortunately, our collective entreaties to some of the young arrowheads of the NSERS protests were ignored. Our past experience with organizing protests has shown that there comes a time when strategies are re-evaluated. In 2010, when we marched to the National Assembly, to protest power hijack, after registering our demands, we left the complex alley enough to avoid the counter-protesters who trailed us. Subsequently, when we marched to Lagos State Secretariat, Alausa, we registered our demands, handed a letter to the governor then, and left the arena. When we marched to Asarok some weeks later, we presented a letter to the Secretary of the Government of the Federation and left thereafter. Similar protests held across the globe. The cumulative effect of this protest forced the National Assembly to invoke the doctrine of necessity by which President Goodluck Jonathan Ebele Jonathan became acting president and later president. 
in 2012 when we needed to gather to protest against a patently corrupt fuel subsidy regime. We converged at the Ghani Fahimi Park, a venue that was unobstructive to vehicular movement. Our rallying cry was kill corruption, not Nigerians. For five days, we brought the nation to a standstill through the massive gathering of Nigerians. However, when by the fifth day of the protest, we caught wind that the good luck Jonathan government would deploy armed soldiers in the early hours of the morning to dismantle our installations and potentially engineer a bloodbath, we deliberated and decided that our desire to see change was not worth the blood of any Nigeria. At the risk of being misunderstood and maligned, we called off the protests and channeled our collective energy in a more suitable direction. Our change of strategies from the oppositioner to the propositioner gave us access to the Jonathan administration to influence policy changes in range, a range of areas. It also won us the trust of President Goodluck Jonathan so that during the 2015 contentious elections, we were able to mediate between the contenders and we worked to ensure that President Jonathan left office with his head held high as a Democrat. As a result, <laughs> That's what we did, and they are both living witnesses of how we involved international uh, ambassadors or ambassadors of nations and sat with them behind the scene to ensure that there was a peaceful transfer. President Jonathan, as a result of our cordial relationship, wrote a tribute for my 60th birthday, which I still cherish to today. Our proximity allowed us to protest to the president directly when the national interest demanded it. All the subsequent impact we made was due to a timely decision to change, to change strategies to avert bloodshed. This is why I am heartbroken by the current events. Citizen of our great nation, to build the Nigeria of our dreams is a collaborative responsibility. We must not pitch one generation against another. Generational integration rather than generational shift, should be our strategy of choice. As I've said in times past, the hindsight of the older generation must propel the foresight of the younger generation. The dreams of the fathers and mothers must be the backdrop of the visions of the sons and daughters. The wisdom of the elders must guide the knowledge of the youth as we build the Nigeria of our dreams. I submit to this young generation where there are no patriarchs and matriarchs, there will be no offspring. Nation building is a continuum. There must be a unity of purpose across generations and across regions. This unity of purpose means we choose to see the plight of the Almajuris and their inability to access quality education, not as a northern problem, but as a Nigerian problem. Because we are a nation of human connection, we choose to see the mother of 17-year-old Tina Ezekwe by a trigger-happy policeman in Lagos, not as a southern problem, but as a Nigerian problem. That's why every heart, young or old, male or female, in the east, west, north, and south of Nigeria must beat with one rhythm. This is why every Nigerian voice must declare with one accord and serves and the state-aided robbery squad. At this juncture, I will need audience participation to, to let me go home rejoicing in the Lord that you consented to what is being said today. I will make a sentence and I will lift up my hand if you agree, just shout, and SARS. Can I repeat that? I will read a statement, and I will lift up my hand, and if you agree with that statement, what are you going to say? And SARS. And the brutalization and murder of the Nigerian people by reckless police operatives and soldiers. And, and the oppression and subjugation of the Nigerian people by those who are 
ought to protect and serve them. Yes, and the diversion of funds here marked for the provision of quality education and health care for our people. Yes, and the inflation of contracts and give the Nigerian people quality roads and efficient transportation network. Yes, and the corruption that has denied our people access to steady electricity supply. Yes, and political banditry and the looting of the treasury to build political war chests. Yes, and vote buying, electoral fraud, and the killing of innocent Nigerians just to win elections. And legislative bringandage, budget padding, backdoor allowances, and the siphoning of funds through perennially uncompleted constituency projects. Yes, and judicial rascality and the merchandising of justice to the highest bidder. Yes, and the state aided robbery squad. Answers to the Nigerian people. Answers so that they can have access to every resource required to actualize the Nigerian dream. Yes, you may be seated. The Nigeria of our dreams. The Nigerian dream is the aspiration of that young graduate who decides to learn an honest vocation. Vocation and to create jobs rather than succumb to the frustrations of unemployment or resort to crime. The Nigerian dream is a drive that wakes that father who lives in sun water and who must leave home before dawn at the risk of being robbed just to beat the dense Lagos traffic where he labors at the Lagos Island to put food on the table for his family. The Nigerian dream is the hope behind the sacrifice of that Nigerian teacher who continues to prepare lesson notes to teach school children in dilapidated classrooms, to administer and grade homework and tests, and to organize extra revision classes months after a last salary was paid. The Nigerian dream is what propels the Nigerian business owner who strives in difficult environments with limited access to funds or electricity to create solutions and deliver innovative services across sectors from agriculture and finance to communication and entertainment. The Nigerian dream is the hope of every Nigerian who lost a job or a business or even a loved one to the COVID-19 pandemic, but who has refused to stay down and is now re-energized and propelled by that tireless bounce back spirit that makes us Nigerians. The Nigerian dream is the fuel that has found the flames of those young Nigerians on the streets of Lagos, Abuja, Bini, Ibado, Oweri, Ogbomosho, Jos, Makodi, and cities across the Nigerian landscape and the diaspora, as well as on various social media platforms, all chanting the rallying cry for freedom and search. The Nigerian dream is that mental portrait of the Nigeria of our honest hopes, the new Nigeria, a nation that is possible, a nation we must come together to create, a Nigeria where the right to life is sacred and no one is brutalized or extrajudicially murdered, where no one goes to bed hungry and no child is left without access to quality education, where our homes, our schools, our streets, our villages, our highways and cities are safe and secure, and Nigerians can walk, play, or travel with their minds at rest and go to bed with their hearts at peace. A Nigeria where our hospitals are life saving institutions, and every Nigerian has access to quality health care, where no youth is unemployed, and our young women and men are job creators, where businesses strive on innovation and made in Nigerian goods can compete anywhere in the world. We are homes and businesses, have access to uninterrupted power supply, and ideas are facilitated by functional infrastructure and cutting-edge technology. 
We are no part of our nation. North, south, east, or west has a reason to feel marginalized. And where every Nigerian is proud to say, I am a Nigerian. A Nigeria that is a model for Africa and a beacon of hope to the world. That is the Nigeria of our dreams. That is the Nigeria of my dreams. I hope that is the Nigeria of your dream. If that is it, then we must come together to build that Nigeria. Now let me touch on a very touchy issue. Nation building in a time of difficulty. In the midst of public outrage over the brutal repression of protesters by the Nigerian government, with the nation in a state of emergency, it will appear that now is not the right time to talk about building the Nigeria of our dreams. However, I believe that the ultimate resolution of the current challenges we are confronted with as a nation lies in our ability to embrace a compelling picture of our desired future. No picture, no future. I am confident that this ground zero state of our nation can become the foundational launch pad for the building of a great nation. As history shows us, the great nations are built not on beds of roses, but on the rocky grounds of adversity. That was the story of Israel, a modern nation that was forged out of four centuries of slavery and for decades of wandering in a desolate wilderness. It was the story of the United States of America, a global power founded by immigrants who fled Europe to the New World and advanced westward against an intolerable wilderness. It was the story of Japan, a war-torn country which emerged from the devastation of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings to achieve one of the fastest economic recoveries of the 20th century. It was the story of Germany, devastated by two world wars, but rising from the ruins of the Second World War to become the industrial model of the world. It was the story of Singapore, rejected by Malaysia and sandwiched between adversarial neighbors, yet rising to become a center of global finance and the world's leading model of infrastructural development. It is the story of Dubai, a once sandy desert that has transformed the world's skylines and become one of the most visited cities in the world. Many people think Dubai is a country. No, it's a city. It is the unfolding story of Rwanda, a landlocked country which emerged from a gruesome genocide to become Africa's space setter in innovation and economic growth. It is why I believe this is the best time to rebuild Nigeria. The pathway from dream to manifestation, I would like to recommend the message I preached a long time ago, titled, The Best Dreams Come to Pass When You Are Weak. The pathway from the present state of our nation to the Nigeria of our dreams is paved with transformational landmarks in four dimensions. How many dimensions? Four. Transformational landmarks in four dimensions, namely culture, structure, infrastructure, and infrastructure. Say that with me. Culture, structure, infrastructure, and infrastructure. These are the four strong pillars around which the Citadel Global Community Church is built as a governmental, authoritative, powerful institution, generating solutions, influencing policy, and providing clarity. And these are the four building blocks from which a new nation can be forged. The similarity between the vision that produced this Citadel complex in four years and that of the new Nigeria is captured in the text of speech delivered at the fundraising dinner for the Citadel Complex on September 3, 2016. 
When you came in today, and if you don't have one, they will give it to you. They presented this. Every part underlined and bold in this text of speech is speaking about the union between the vision that produced the citadel in four years and what Nigeria can become in the nearest future. If we can only learn to do things right and to do the right things. Let me begin with the first one. Our national culture. The first landmark in a journey from the status quo to the Nigeria of our dreams is the birth of a new Nigerian culture. The cultural dimension of nation building is a value system or value superstructure upon which the nation must be built. It brings to focus what I call the four IDs of our nationhood, namely the Nigerian identity, the Nigerian idiosyncrasy, the Nigerian idiocy, and the Nigerian ideal. To address the current issues plaguing our nation and to make meaningful progress towards the Nigeria of our dreams, we must resolve certain unanswered questions the border on the Nigerian identity. Who is a Nigerian? What is the irreducible minimum standard of decency below which no Nigerian must fall? To find answers to this question, I recommend revisiting the Nigerian Charter for National Reconciliation and Integration, which we by God's grace proposed to the 2014 National Conference and was unanimously passed by that conference. This is my second thing that you are going home with, the Nigerian Charter for National Reconciliation and Integration. This was passed unanimously by the conference. By the grace of God, we propose it to the conference and thank God for the vice chairman of that conference is here. It was passed unanimously and you will have it to read hereafter. You can take a copy home. We must, discon we must from that deconstruct the Nigerian idiosyncrasy, those modes of behavior that have defined us over time for better or for worse, our exuberance, our ostentation, our love for pleasure, our aversion to risk, our resilient tolerance of adversity, our inclination to ethnic identities, and our religiosity that encourages us to say, live and for God. God did. We must tell ourselves home truths as to how these modes of behavior have contributed to our current state and how they could be geared towards unleashing our collective potential and building the Nigeria of our dreams. Upon further reflection, we will discover that by not positively annexing our idiosyncrasy, we continue to court what I call the Nigerian idiocy. This is what is at play when politicians corner the nation's resources through the politics of banditry while citizens remain spectators, cheering looters on. It is what is at play when we defend the corrupt because they are our kinsmen and we sell our votes for a loaf of bread and a bag of rice. It is what is at play when our nation produces crude oil but it imports refined petroleum product at a higher cost. When we favor consumption over capacity building, when we are more inclined to devouring over discovery, when we choose imitation over innovation, and when we embrace mediocrity over merit in the selection of our leaders. The antidote to the Nigerian idiocy is the Nigerian ideal. The Nigerian ideal is a quest, the quest to redefine ourselves by our most noble qualities and aspirations. It is a quest for a Nigeria where no citizen is subjected to living below an irreducible minimum standard of decency. It is a quest for a new Nigerian culture, one in which the people are bound by common hopes and common dreams, irrespective of ethnic and religious differences. In the spirit of the new Nigerian culture, government must jettison the leadership model of the biblical Pharaoh and Rehoboam who ruined their nations through obstinacy. Leaders must begin to listen to the people and show empathy to their plight. We need leaders like Nehemiah who quelled a protest not by the force of arms but by the moral authority of exemplary sacrifice, sacrificial leadership. 
We need leaders like the late Nelson Mandela, who converted institutions of division and oppression to symbols of unity and empathy. We need sensitive leaders who are not ashamed to shed tears with the wounded and who can tell the broken, your pain is my pain and I will do everything in my power to lift your body. The new Nigerian culture is what has ignited in the hearts and minds of our young people a new wave of patriotism, a rejection of the status quo, and the demand for accountability among public servants. The new Nigerian culture is not defined by antagonism. I like to repeat that. The new Nigerian culture is not defined by antagonism as an end in itself, or looting or pillaging as a solution, but is shaped by willingness to take responsibility, to find new answers to all questions, to refuse to simply accept that this is the best we can do and the best we can be as a people. To this end, rather than destroy, we must build. Rather than revel in attacks on tangible and intangible infrastructure, from buses and police stations to palaces and state-owned cyber assets, we must protect our common patrimony. Instead of accepting a status quo that appears to leave us no choice, but to go through the back door, we must build endearing edifices of open governance using such bricks as the Freedom of Information Act. Our conduct shall at all times be moral, be ethical, and be legal. Moderated by the reality, there are no short calls in nation building. From protests to progress, we must now proceed to the next phase of citizen engagement. Please listen to me carefully. We must organize ourselves like the nation builders who teamed up with Nehemiah to build the wall of the city. With one hand, they built the wall, and with the other, they held a sword to defend themselves. In like manner, when this battle is eventually won, we must defend our gains. Some of us must join civil society groups to continue to hold government to account. Some of us must become entrepreneurs, creating jobs that will build our economy. Some of us must become public servants, making and implementing policies that can facilitate and sustain growth. Some of us must step into politics to ensure that the best of us lead the rest of us. Whichever path we take, every one of us must be ready at all times to defend our freedom so that never again will our people be subjected to such indignity. Now, our national structure. Upon the foundation of a new Nigerian culture, we must revisit conversations around the structure of Nigeria. The answer protests have once again brought to the fore the diversity of the challenges and aspirations of the Nigerian people across geopolitical zones. Let me, at this juncture, address the young people, particularly in the North, who have taken a different position and call for reforms rather than the outright disbandment of SARS. I'm referring to those who argued or are still arguing that they need such tactical formations to combat their peculiar security challenges in the North. First of all, I say to these young Nigerians, you have the right to hear your views, no matter how, how unpopular they may be. We hear you too because you are also Nigerians. We do not desire a nation that is intolerant of seemingly contrarian opinions, nor a nation where one cap must fit all. Instead, we desire a nation where policy ideas are debated at the policy round table, where facts are separated from fiction, and where the best ideas are implemented for the benefit of all, bearing the realities and opportunities of each geopolitical zone in mind. We desire a nation where policy is based on evidence and where governance decisions are preceded by thorough strategic analysis. It has become clear, I say it again, to those who have ears to hear, it has become clear that an excessively centralized government cannot sustain a culture of responsive leadership and responsible citizenship. As Nigerians begin to exercise the powers of the distinguished office of the citizen, we must demand a government that is close enough to facilitate our welfare and strong enough 
to provide security. This is why I'm confident that the current wave of people movement and individual responsibility will ultimately lead to the restructuring of our nation. Now to our national infrastructure. As we the people begin to take responsibility to shape the new Nigerian culture, the government must facilitate the right kind of infrastructure that can channel that culture into productive ventures. Our cities and communities must host affordable and decent housing units, functional education and health facilities, industrial facilities, sports and recreation facilities, all linked by efficient multimodal transportation networks and broadband technology protected by intelligent security architecture and powered by sustainable energy solutions. Such state-of-the-art infrastructure will facilitate the development of our young people, the incubation and growth of enterprise, and the drastic reduction in crime rates. Within the construct of our national security infrastructure, let me use this opportunity to reiterate my call again for a new approach to youth development in the context of the National Youth Service Corps, NYSC. I've said it before, and I'm saying it again. This has become all necessary, all the more necessary, with the recent brutalization of the Nigerian youth by the police force and the military. The NYC provides an opportunity to achieve capacity building for economic development, to beef up our national security and defense infrastructure, as well as build a bridge of trust between the people and the armed forces. At this juncture, I reiterate my recommendation that NYSE becomes an optional, an optional two-year program with the first year spent on military training for our young people and the second year spent on agro-entrepreneurship. We can feed ourselves if we will use the energy of our youth. We can feed our nation and export food outside of this country. In addition, I recommend that a minimum of an ordinary national diploma OND obtained from a recognized polytechnic or two years in a recognized university with a cumulative grade point, average not lower than a second class lower division, be among the prerequisites for admission into the Nigeria Police Academy. This will compel an upgrade of Nigeria Police Academy to a degree awarding tertiary institution affiliated with the Nigerian University transform the Nigerian Police Force into a Nigerian Police Service and further build the bridge between Nigerians and the police. Now our national infrastructure. The infrastructure question is what for years has been referred to as a national question. It is a quest for how best to coexist as a nation irrespective of our differences and diversities. The infrastructure question has remained unanswered since the era of our founding fathers and it explains the various conflicts that define our nation, including inter-ethnic, inter-religious, partisan, and especially now intergenerational conflicts. It explains the ethnic coloration wrongly applied to the destruction of lives and property in Lagos State has been done by Igbos and someone else releasing a video that the Yorubas are going to expel them from terrorism. What about the dash? What utter nonsense. This explains the ethnic coloration wrongly applied to the destruction of lives and property in Lagos State, the Southwest, and other parts of the country by hoodlums who hijacked the NSAS protest. I'm glad that the Hornese and the Afeni Ferry and leaders of thought have jointly issued letters that those things are not true and they are not so. <clears throat> Resolving the infrastructure question calls for a national redemption experience and an appropriate institutional framework. A national redemption experience is modeled in Revelation 5, 8 to 10. Revelation chapter 5, 8 to 10, he reads, and I quote, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp 
and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Aren't you glad we are still praying in this nation? And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. A national redemption experience entails forsaken a primordial attachment to ethnicity and tribalism and pledging allegiance to a higher national identity. That's why you can never, <laughs> tribalism, ethnicity can never produce good governance. An appropriate institutional framework for such an experience will be the Presidential Commission for National Reconciliation reintegration and rebirth which I've called for on various occasions. I'd like you to see what I presented to those in power last year. A video. Please play the video. By the vehicle of an executive order and in full consultation with the National Assembly and the Council of State, the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari Jisif R, shall establish a Presidential Commission for National Reconciliation, Reintegration and Rebirth. The aim being to set the nation on the path to and ensure her emergence and sustenance as a new Nigeria and enviable global power. Chaired by a wise and discerning individual of incorruptible, high moral standing and unquestionable integrity to be appointed by the President, the Commission shall be charged with the task of implementing a four-phase plan that will via six zonal commissions, headed by zonal commissioners appointed in the six geopolitical zones of the nation, launch a nationwide reconciliation and reintegration drive, creatively communicate the new Nigeria narrative and achieve a new nation. Through well thought out and carefully constructed economic master plans tailored to fit each zone's peculiarities and that will cover all the key sectors in each zone, the progressive harmonization of policies, human capacity building and rapid socio-economic advancement among other goals shall be achieved. Also, with the introduction and assistance of a counterpart funding mechanism, the target being aimed at is a new generation of processed and integrated leaders who will ensure the consolidation and expansion of Nigeria's positioning as the prosperous global power she so evidently has the potential to be. I presented that video to the powers that be as a way forward to move our nation forward. And guess what? There's no army as powerful as an idea whose time has come. The Presidential Commission for National Reconciliation, Reintegration and Rebirth or Restructuring must be charged with a mandate to address infrastructural issues, reconcile sectional interests, rebuild trust in the Nigerian state and birth a truly integra integrated Nigeria. Furthermore, this commission can serve as a truth and reconciliation commission where citizens can publicly narrate their ordeals with agents of the Nigerian state and find healing, compensation, justice, and reconciliation. Above all, this commission can design a law. Are you still here? Yeah. Above all, this commission can design and implement a strategic agenda for the restructuring of our federal system. By so doing, we can convert the current ugly narrative from a state-aided robbery squad, SARS, to a strategic agenda for a restructured state, SARS. We are moving from a state-aided robbery squared to a strategic agenda for a restructured state. In conclusion, appeal to Nigerian youth, 
whose patriotic spirits have been brutalized and traumatized by a repressive Nigerian state. I appeal to them not to lose hope in Nigeria. One of their age mates said to me, I'm dusting my foreign passport, I'm out of here. No, don't go. I encourage you to keep hope alive because the Nigeria of your dream, the new Nigeria, is within reach. I appeal to the older generation to speak up at this point in defense of our hard and freedom. This is not the nation our founding fathers lived and died for. This is not the nation we fought for in the trenches of pro-democracy movements. This is not the nation we hope to bequeath to our children. We will build this nation not upon the altar of the blood of our young people, but on their visions and aspirations. I am confident that we can end the brutalization of our people, put an end to state-aided robbery squirt, and begin the process of nation building. It is time to turn the stumbling blocks of our past into stepping stones to our future. Let us therefore arise to build a great nation that all who have died in the quest for a new nation will not have died in vain and that the Nigerian dream will become the Nigerian reality. Nigeria will be saved. Nigeria will be changed. Nigeria will become great in our lifetime. Thank you. God bless you. God bless the Republic of Nigeria. And God bless the continent of Africa.